<laughs> so we are here today with Janet Grillo, and she is the writer, director, and producer of the independent film Fly Away. Thank you for joining us today, Janet. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. So what gave you the idea to write Fly Away, to write the script? Are you the mother of an autistic child? Yes, exactly. So I'm the mother of a son on the spectrum of autism. And uh, during my journey of parenting, um, I encountered a lot of challenges raising my son, but even more so uh, recognized the heroic courage of other parents around me whose children were even more impacted than mine. And I did have the experience of making the very heart-wrenching decision to place my son in a residential therapeutic treatment facility, I mean a, a boarding school. And um, it was a really hard choice to make, but very much the necessary one. And, um, and it was a journey of personal discovery for me to have to recognize how much my own identity had become totally subsumed in being his caregiver to the point where it wasn't serving him. Right. Uh, it certainly wasn't serving me. And so as much as a catharsis to kind of process the experience that I had been through for myself and also to share the journey and the experience that we as parents have, I felt really compelled to, to make, this, make this film. I had written and directed a short film that was really the day in the life of the mother of a teenage son with Asperger's, which is more like my son. And I had the privilege and the opportunity of showing that short film at various film festivals around the country. And invariably, at the end of the movie, in the audience, would be parents of other children on the spectrum. And invariably, the first question from the parents was always, are you going to make a feature? And after about a year of this, I started to realize they were saying, please make a feature. Right. And I recognized that I had the ability to tell our story, not just my story, and then I started to feel that I had the responsibility to do it. Um, so not to sound too grand about it, but I felt like I was speaking on behalf of our community about a very special and shared experience. You know, I've heard people say that every child on the spectrum is different, which I agree. I think if you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Right. But in a way, I feel like all parents are the same. Yes. That we all, you know, right. We, we all do. share this obsessive dedication, and uh, <laughs> I have to and, say, I watched the movie, and I watched the movie with my husband, and um, it's the first film I've seen that I think actually um, accurately portrays uh, parenthood with an autistic yeah. child. I mean, the meltdowns, the what you have to sacrifice, the worrying about. Um, if they if they if they go roaming, um, yeah. Just um, even even the struggle between the mother and and the father of the yeah. of the child. There's I think as mothers we struggle with. You feel like you have to have to help your child, but I feel a lot of the times the fathers have. Um, I don't know about um, many mothers I've talked to struggle that they feel torn between the parent, between their 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 child and the the husband yeah. or yeah. or the father. Well, I will say that to my knowledge, Fly Away is the only narrative fiction film about parenting a child on the spectrum of autism that is made by the parent of a child on autism, a spectrum of autism. There are television shows like. Um, uh, Parenthood, which is a TV show here in America for those right. who are listening who are in overseas. Um, and Jason Kadams, who's the creator and the head writer, uh, does have a son on the spectrum of autism. So that's a television show that I think very accurately depicts a lot of the challenges and struggles, but I don't know another narrative fiction feature. Right. And so I, I did feel that I had an opportunity, a unique opportunity, to be able to tell the story from the inside out. And um, to be honest about it and candid about it, and that yes, I think that we are, there are many, many dedicated fathers out there, but ultimately it falls to the mom in right. so many ways, and that the biological imperative 
of the bond between mother and child is just um, it's irreducible. Right. And you know they, they they say that if you're in an airplane and the plane's going down, you should put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then on your child. But I'd be curious to know how many mothers actually do. It right. goes against biology to, to have that impulse. You, you must save your child first. And I think that for those of us with children who are in a great state of need, we are pouring our resources into that child, not recognizing that we ourselves are suffocating and, um, and lacking oxygen. And that's not serving the child either. And, and so that's very much at the core of the journey of flyaway, that it's really the mother's story. It's a dynamic between the mother and the daughter, and I'm extremely proud of the performance that Ashley Ricards, who is a brilliant young actress who does not have autism, but it very authentically depicts the character who does have autism, and she's a full-fledged character. She's a human being with autism. She's not playing a symptom. She's not playing a disorder or a label. She's playing a human, and the dynamic between the two is very much at the core, but ultimately, this is the journey of the mother to have to recognize that her love alone is not enough and that to recognize that the needs of her child have eclipsed her ability to meet them and she simply must let go and give over and accept the help that, thank God, she's able to find. And in a way, I feel like this is a universal story of parenting because ultimately it is the nexus point that every parent reaches whether your child has special needs or not, there's a point at which you recognize that in order for them to move forward in their life and become independent, you have to let go. But when you have a child with special needs, that moment is fraught with peril. And it's that love, that combination of love and terror <laughs> that has a kind of a grip on us. And that's the, the dramatic situation, the dilemma, the dynamic, and the journey that I attempted to describe in Flyway. You did a fantastic job. I was going to ask you, how did you go about making the film and finding um, finding these actresses? Um, how, how did you go about that? So, um, I've been in the film industry for a long time. Um, as a right, you're, a film, you're a film professor at NYU, right? I'm currently, yeah, a, a professor of film at the New York University Tisch School of the Arts in the undergraduate film program. And prior to that, I had been a studio executive at New Line Cinema and um, an independent film producer. And um, I had always intended to write and direct my own movies, but got sidetracked into making the films of other people. And so finally, I had a very compelling reason and need to step forward and tell my own story. But because of my decades of experience in the industry as a professional, I had access to a lot of resources and relationships with a lot of other industry professionals, including some actors. So um, the wonderful actress Beth Broderick, who plays Jean, had been a friend of mine for many years. Um, Greg Gurman, who's also wonderful <laughs> and plays the role of Tom, I'd also known for many years. And then um, through my friendships and relationships with casting director, I was able to um, work with a wonderful casting director to just reach out into the professional community and we auditioned and found Ashley Ricards. Great. And that was really a blessing. That was like a deliverance from God. <laughs> <laughs> um, so were all of your goals met for this movie? What Did you set out with a certain set of goals? Were, were they all met? The creative goals absolutely were met, and I'm, again, I'm really proud of it. This is a film that we made on an ultra-low budget. This is a truly independent film. We raised the money independently, and we shot the film in 14 days. The wow. total budget, from soup to nuts, delivery to our distributor, cost under $200,000. And um, we premiered the film um, in dramatic competition at South by Southwest Film Festival in Austin, Texas, and it got very good reviews. We put into limited theatrical release immediately after. Um, South by Southwest is at the end of March and April, as we know, is Autism Awareness Month. So we wanted to be able to, when there was a national conversation about the topic and a sort of a pool of light on these sorts of concerns that we could step into that pool of light. And we were supported by Autism Speaks to do a social outreach campaign and some advanced screenings. And so we took advantage of that timing um, and then since then, the film has been available on Netflix, Amazon, internationally 
on iTunes. It's um, in all of the English-speaking territories, uh, UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Um, it's also on Netflix in Scandinavia. However, despite all of this outreach and effort, um, it hasn't reached as much of the community as we would hope and hasn't crossed out to the broader audience, which has been my great goal. So that although creatively and artistically, I'm completely satisfied and privileged to have been able to work with such wonderful professionals and made a film that we're all really proud of. You should and be. Have gotten, thank you. <laughs> and have gotten the critical response that you know you spend your whole life hoping to get. And um, most importantly, we, we shared a truth that, that my great goal was to candidly describe and express who our kids are and what our journey and our dedication to our kids is. Because, you know, this population is aging. You know, there was a crest in the wave. There was a kind of a peak in the autism epidemic. And that, that, that crested peak, of which my son is a part at age 19, is moving to a cliff, aging out of the system, and about to just crash. And there's a tsunami wave of epidemic behind them. And what happens when these kids become adults? And we're going to, and especially what happens when they outlive us as parents? Right. And we're going to need for the larger society to step in and help and support and participate in their care and include them in their community in a loving, accepting way. And if we're going to ask society at large to help and meet this need, then we have to describe this need candidly. And right. so that was one of the reasons that I felt it was so important to make this film as though it were a documentary. It's not a documentary, let me be clear. It's a narrative fiction film. It's not a documentary. But many people who've seen it have wondered, is this a documentary? Because it has that quality of verisimilitude and naturalism that we wanted to candidly say, this is what it's like. And we shot it... Um, in a small house that looks like typical America, you just pull back the curtains of any house in suburban America and wow, look at what's going on inside. This can be your neighbor. This can be the family down the street. This could be, you know, that, that family in the church pew with the child who's behaving strangely. Um, sorry, I'm, I live in New York City and there's noise in the background. <laughs> That's <laughs> to, fine. <laughs> talk, about, right, talk about verisimilitude and naturalism. So, so it was very important to say that, that we are you, that this is, um, you know, 1% of all Americans have autism. That's, you know, millions of people. Right. It's and a huge population. It's a huge population, and, and sadly, it's a growing population. Right. And so now we have 1 in 10 boys in America. I actually think it's 1 in 9 boys in America. And so these are the people that you see in your grocery store when you go to get an ice cream cone. And how are we as a society prepared to, to include them, incorporate, and accept them? And I'm a firm believer that we don't love our children in spite of who they are. We love them because of who they are. And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of mythology out there of like, oh, autism people are special. And the kind of magic special child who comes in like, makes our life fuller and better. And, uh, you know, I've had so many people say, oh, your son's autistic. What's his gift? What's his special gift? You know, like every autistic person is a genius. And, and I've had people say, this is the next phase of evolution. I mean, this is all garbage and fantasy. And, I, and, and to me, it's sad because it's saying we have to have some romantic, rosy-eyed view in order to accept and love the least amongst us. No, right. this is a disability. And it's important to know that most of the people on the spectrum of autism are not Asperger geniuses. They're not people who are like Bill Gates are going to go out and create the next you know, word processing system. They're people who are disabled by profound neurological problems. And so I thought it was imperative to dramatize uh, a person with autism who's really severely impacted. Oh, now, here's where my dog's going to start barking. You're getting a whole. Okay, you, you, can probably, you can probably hear the babies crying in the background for me. Yes, so. I did. I did. So there we go. <laughs> I have three small children. So we have, um, they're about to turn two, five, and six. Wow. So, yes. I'm so impressed. You certainly have a very full plate, and on top of it, doing this project, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But as but autism yes, parents, we are indefatigable as autism yes. parents. Yes. 
We, we conquered the world, I'm convinced. Well, so, you know, we are. I mean, when you look at every autism advocacy organization, it's parent-driven. When you look at the important research that's been done, it's because the parents have demanded it. When yes. you look at every phase of rising to meet the need of the child, it's because the parents have been at the forefront, insisting, demanding, creating, cajoling, causing legislation, you know, causing intentional communities for adults to occur. That's the next phase of the revolution. You know, it's, it's, it's us, and I feel very proud to be numbered amongst this, this force. <laughs> Me too. I, um, it's, it's one of my goals, too, to make sure people understand the reality between having a child with autism. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times um, we, we've actually stopped going to church for a while because I couldn't stand the looks that I was getting because she doesn't, and what they say is, and I quote, look autistic. Right. I didn't realize autism had a look, I would yes, tell right. them. Right. But yes, I, I truly believe that with um, knowledge comes understanding, and with understanding comes acceptance. So I'm trying to raise people's knowledge of what autism is. Not everyone with autism is like Rain Man. Not everyone right. with autism is a genius. Right. Um, but we all love them just the way they are. Every person right. is different. Why not? Why not accept everyone for who they are? Right. Um. And so that so towards 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 that end, just to sort of complete my my thought from before is that when you asked to have all of my goals been realized, that no, the greatest goal that I've had is that this is a film that would reach beyond the community of of families who've been impacted by autism to those that are not familiar with autism to help them have a window of insight. And unfortunately, we haven't really crossed over. So I'm very grateful to an opportunity like this to help to spread the word and hope that if people do take the time to see this movie and if it moves them in any way, that they'll share it, that they'll talk about it, that they'll post about it or tweet about it or send an email or a link or whatever in all the ways that we communicate with each other, yeah. communicate about it so that people know that it's there and that this can be a tool uh, to encourage communication and understanding. And that's my greatest hope is that this becomes a vehicle for a larger purpose, um, a well, film that's satisfying in and of itself, but has you know some a function. Well, I certainly hope Autism Parenting Magazine can help you out with that. We, <laughs> it, it, I have lost my train of thought. How? Let's see. How? Um, how old was your son when you decided? When you came to the realization that you were going to have to to take the next step. Yeah, uh, he was 12. And he was, puberty was hitting hard. And, uh, you know, puberty for somebody who's very neurologically sound is hell. Right, <laughs> you know? and then you throw uh, this in the mix. Right, I mean, you know, when, when a, a child who's as fragile as, as our kids are, you throw puberty in and it's just, all the wheels come off. And it was, um, he, he was failing to thrive, you know. He was really falling apart. He had lost school placement, and most importantly, he was miserable. He was violent, and he was uh, in despair. And um, so as hard as it was to recognize that he needed to be in a, a, a place that could contain him and offer him 24-7 intense constructed containment, and I don't mean like bad containment like a straitjacket. I mean a stable, safe environment with people who could respond to him therapeutically at all times. Right. And um, so we were really blessed to be able to find a fantastic school. Um, it's called the Devereux Glenholm School. It's in Connecticut. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, it's like acres of rolling hills and gorgeous part of, of New England and the people who are kind and gentle and generous and the students live in cottages and they they learn to self-care and cook and they do community activities and there's a beautiful theater and they put on plays and, and yes they have special education classes and, and he's doing beautifully. He has a girlfriend. Oh, he has a best, yes, he has a best friend. Oh, even uh, better. He started to sing in all the cabarets and um, it's it's very moving. And, uh, That's great. I and I have I have been at Dev, uh, Glen Home Devereaux, and it is it's a it's a beautiful beautiful facility, fantastic staff. Um, they you know they don't they have a pool. 
Yes, they have, they have a pool. They, they have, have a patio where you can order ice cream. I said, I don't think I would ever leave. Um, <laughs> they have horses. They have go-karts. They have a small restaurant where the students work and learn to work in a restaurant so that there's vocational skills as well. It's fantastic. And I, I attempted at the end of Fly Away um, to somehow replicate and mirror so that the, the place, the school that my character Mandy ends up at is, is modeled after Glen Home. And um, I just wish that there were thousands of Glen Homes. I mean, we were incredibly lucky that we were able to find it. Um, I, I, I would hope and wish that there were as many happy endings for as many families out there that need them and I think that's the next step is that we need more resources, more facilities, more schools, not just residential schools but full-time schools that whether it's home placement or not that offer this level of sophistication and uh, you know unfortunately our society is at a time where the need is increasing at a time that the resources are diminishing and uh, frankly it scares me. I really don't know where we're going as a society, as a people, and when you look at the disabled population aging as the time that our economy is 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 contracting, Probably. it's it's terrifying. It's terrifying to think what's going to happen. And uh, I I know personally, I'm having trouble with with uh, <laughs> with the diminishing economy um, taking away services. So. That, that's the extent I'll discuss yeah. that. No, listen, I'm about to go into due process yeah. in, in two weeks. So, listen, we all have to fight for every penny that we can get for yeah. every level of support that, that we desperately need. And the fact is that there's millions of people who need this. It's like a, it's one small pie that's being cut into these tiny slivers, and we all, it's, well, anyway. Any <laughs> So, well, um, do you have any recommendations for people that, that are having trouble letting go? Because I, I, I imagine, I mean, in the movie, they, it's portrayed that um, the mother has trouble letting go of her daughter, and I imagine that it was, it was very emotional for you as well to, to send your son away. Even yeah, it is a I think that, place. Yeah, the the first thing that I would say is to to, to that that idea of like sending your child away is perhaps the, the, that that can be reframed. Is that it's exactly that idea that you're abandoning them or pushing them away is is really very different from allowing them to step forward in their own lives towards the most independent life that they can possibly have. And when you start to recognize that you're becoming the impediment. Um, it's it helps you to to allow to step out of the way. It's not so much you're sending them away as you're stepping out of the way. Right. Because if your child were neurologically typical, they would be making those steps away from you. And so you have to really recognize that even though they're neurologically different and there's limitations, they're still humans with the same range of needs and feelings and desire to be competent, to be independent to make social relationships, emotional relationships separate from you and there's a kind of a symbiosis that often happens between us and our kids, particularly between mothers and, and the children. That, that um, it's like my, my ex-husband, his father used to say I was my son's emotional dialysis machine. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact is that he wasn't going, until I started to unhook the plugs and unplug him from me, he was never going to be able to figure out how to put the oxygen mask on himself, you know, right. and, and it's not like I have left him behind. I mean, I'm still very integrated into his life, you know, and oh, yeah. um, so, but I think that's important for us parents to recognize that you're not abdicating or abandoning. You're just reaching out for additional levels of support and you're still going to be your child's mom or dad and integral to their daily life. Just with more supports around you and around him or her. So that's, I think, important to know. And, um, uh, and that it's to, to, to allow yourself to know that it's hard and also to allow yourself to know that you deserve to have a life as well. I think that's the important piece, is that we tend to be so self-sacrificing that we forget that it's also important to have a self, not just a sacrifice. And that's okay. You're not being a bad parent to recognize that you have needs too, and um, and to allow yourself to take up some space. 
Now, you've had a really good experience with um, with the boarding school, and do you remember or do you happen to know the ages that are allowed? Do they limit it by age or by um, capability? So the school that he attends, and of course every school program is different, mm -hmm. um, but the Glenholm School, uh, it's I think from age 12 till age 21. Oh, okay, and, um, great. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it was stopped at 18 or if, if they, they continue have, to 21. So. Right, so they have a, a post-grad transition into adult living program called the Glen Ridge program. But the high school program, they have the elementary school, middle school, and high school program, and children will graduate by, usually by age 20. And then um, according to FAPE, Free and Appropriate Placement Law, Right. Um, services are available until age 21, and so they have a program to facilitate postgrad. Um, but Glenholm is Den Devereux Glenholm is only one of many, many, many schools out there that serve all kinds of different profiles and different populations and different levels of need. And um, so whoever is listening, I'm <laughs> sure you can find a lot of resources. I'd strongly recommend Autism Speaks website. Autism Speaks website is a font of information resources. And they, there, you can join groups that are local to your area. Well, they list resources and community chat boards, so you can find providers, schools, etc., and, and other parents in your region. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Autism Speaks also has outreach overseas and strong relationships with other autism organizations, uh, particularly in the UK. So there's all kinds of ways for people, and thank God for the age of the internet that we I can know. find each other. And, I know, <laughs> and guide each other towards the places that we need to be. So, and yes, you guys I, are part of that. Here you are <laughs> on the internet, providing this as a context and a conversation and outreach. So that's great. I never thought when um, I mean I've always wanted to be a writer. I was an English major, but English and special ed. But I never thought that I would be running a digital magazine and holding interviews over the computer. So it's it's quite it's quite an experience. I'm glad we can do it though, because we we can reach out to ever, anyone in the world now. It doesn't have to be limited to how far I can drive. So it's, oh, it's, it's amazing. Different. It's true. The world has become you know the t the globe is tiny now, and that's much to our advantage. Yes. So. Um, so I guess my last question would be, what what would be the one piece of advice that you would recommend to our readers? Do you have one uh, other than all the others that you've helpfully included? Yeah. I think to know that uh, the journey with our children is long and that the more that we are understanding about the brain, the more we're understanding its plasticity and that the brain, okay, it loses its plasticity rapidly after age twin, twin, after age 10, rather. But it's plastic till death. And there's constantly new approaches, new inroads, new innovations, new therapies that our kids are continuing to develop and grow. I had the privilege of having a long conversation with the mother of Temple Grandin um, after she saw Fly Away. And she's my total hero, as I'm sure is true of so many other yeah. parents and moms out there who are listening. And she said that her daughter, Temple, is continuing to grow and change. And in this last decade, so Temple's in her 60s, the decade between you know, 50 and 60, she saw a tremendous amount of growth and development. And so I'd like to offer that out there as a beacon of hope to know that you know, there's a lot of twists and turns in the road. It's not necessarily the end of the road. It may just be a big speed bump or a, rat or a radical turn. And um, to, to, to keep striving and hoping and loving. All right. Well, I thank you so much for taking the time with Autism Parenting Magazine, and I hope everyone checks out Fly Away the Movie. I personally watched it on Netflix, and I hope everyone checks it out too. Thank you. And you can find it on Amazon streaming, um, overseas on iTunes, uh, just to repeat for those who are out there in all the English language territories. And in Scandinavia, you can also, if you want to buy a DVD, you can go directly to our website and buy it from us. And that's, um, one little plug, please. No, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> www.flyawaymovie.org. That's www.flyawaymovie.org. 
And also we've got um, a wonderful Facebook page, Flyaway Movie Facebook, and um, a real community of conversation. So please join the conversation on Facebook with us. All right. Thank you.